committee. Um, uh, but some people might know me from Wild U Forest. I sort of co co founded that with with Russell Wynn. So I've been doing a lot uh, in the New Forest over the past uh, 15, 20 years. Um, my main obsession, you'll be glad to hear, I'm not talking about them tonight, is hawfinches. Uh, when I start talking about hawfinches, I often don't stop for a very long time. Uh, but there's no mention of them tonight. Um, but I guess what I'm probably better known for is, is working with hawfinches in the new forest. But my other passion outside of the forest is, is my local patch, uh, which I'll be talking about tonight, just, just because it's on, on my doorstep. Um, it's a fantastic place to go, and hopefully I'll, I'll uh, get that across tonight, my, my passion for for my local patch and I think local patch birding is, is very important for a whole raft of reasons for, for people both the generate the, the data that generated but also just just for the escapism and mental health aspect of getting out somewhere and getting your headspace so um, that's probably a good point to move on into the talk Okay, um, we can probably go straight into the first slide, Barry, if that's all right. Okay, so this this is this is my patch uh, as I see it, Limington Keyhaven Marshes. For those that don't know, it's on the on the New Forest coast, um, uh, situated between Limington and, and Keyhaven. Um, when I talk about my patch, um, my I spend most of my time in the Normandy Salters Marsh and Oxy Marsh area, just because because I live in Livington, it's easy to access from home. Uh, but I'll be talking about the whole area uh, this evening. Um, we'll come back to this map a bit later on in the talk, um, but it's worth um, just just uh, noting the layout here that you as you run down through the marsh from from Normandy at the top uh, down through Saltons and Oxy Marsh. Uh, the, the area probably better known for most birders is Pennington and, and Keyhaven Marsh with the famous uh, sort of Butts Lagoon and, and Fishtail Lagoon where over the years a large number of rarities have turned up. Um, but yes, as I say, I'll be talking about the whole area this evening. First of all, what I'll do, we'll, we'll talk about the seasons um, and what might be found, look, looking at maybe the specialities of each season. Um, and then I'll talk a, a little bit later on in the talk about how I, how I bird the marsh and maybe some of the rarities that have turned up. But starting as we're about to move into winter in a couple of weeks time, uh, it's a good, good place to, to start. So winter on the marshes is, is a fantastic time of year. Um, if we sort of scroll on, sorry. One of the key features really of the marsh at this time of year are the, are the waders and the wildfowl. Um, wildfowl in particular, it's a very important site. It's been monitored um, year on year over, a, um, certainly since I've been involved in 20 years, I've been doing the webs count, but it's uh, since the 80s, there's been regular counts and it's, it's found to be getting more and more important each year for species such as teal pictured here. Um, I did the the monthly webs count last weekend actually on a on a bit of a breezy day and we counted um over a thousand teal just at normandy marsh alone on a typical winter's day you might have uh, over three thousand teal across the marsh and add to that species like widgeon and pintail um and in smaller numbers um, of other species um there's large numbers of birds across the marsh it's a fantastic and, and very important stopping off point for a range of species but what I'll do is I'll focus on some of the some of the more interesting species that are, are maybe a bit more regular that people can can often catch up with on the marsh and starting here with scorp uh, this is a, a male and a female greater scorp um, most years we get scorp turn up on the marsh um, they're fairly fairly erratic um, or they're generally uh, fairly reliable to be found on if, if there are any in the area they will almost always be at the Normandy Marsh end of the site because that is actually the deepest lagoon on the marsh. Scorp like deep water and they'll occasionally be found on eight acres pond as well or sometimes offshore. And here we've got a male and a female. Uh, these two are on eight acre pond um, I can't remember, five or six years ago uh, but it's a nice example of comparison between the male and the female. So the male on the left um, with the pale flanks and the pale back uh, the female on the right with uh, the distinctive um, sort of white nasal saddle appearance that, that she has. Um, that's a good, good feature to look out for uh, with Scorp. 
Uh, although you have to be a bit wary, some tufty ducks can occasionally have that. Um, but if you're looking, if you think you might have a scorp somewhere, then that, that, the rounded, bulky head is a good thing to look for. So I tend to, if a species like this, I tend to try and tick off two or three features before I'm actually happy uh, that it is what you think it is. Um, as I say, they're, they're, they're fairly annual um, at the marsh, but also quite erratic. They seem to spend their time between Sowley Pond um, and the Limiting Keyhaven marshes when we have them in the Western Solent. Um, so that can make them tricky to catch up with. Funny enough, there was one on Normandy Lagoon about two or three weeks ago. Um, this is another classic uh, winter species. They used to be fairly regular. When I first started birding the, the marsh, they were pretty much annual. Uh, these are long-tailed ducks. Um, as with, with the scorp, as I mentioned a minute ago, they're generally on the lagoons. They'll almost be always found in, in fresh or brackish water. Long-tailed ducks, almost always offshore. I don't think I've ever had one on, on any of the lagoons. Um, these two are in Oxy Lake um, a few years back, but a good, a good little tip when you're looking at long-tailed ducks, they can be confusing and they're almost always in this, this sort of juvenile, sort of grubby sort of plumage they turn up in. Uh, but the male, a, a young male um, on my left of the picture, the paler bird of the two, you can just see at the tip of its bill a bit of a more palely pinky patch at the tip of the bill. And that's, that's a feature of males, whereas the female, which is on the right, has an all dark bill. Um, so that's a good, a good feature to look for when you're looking at long-tailed ducks, especially in this, in this juvenile plumage, because it can be hugely variable. Um, we haven't had long-tailed duck on the marsh that I've seen for, for a couple of years now, so surely, hopefully, we'll be due one soon. Uh, another regular feature of the marsh uh, is not especially a rarity, but they're, they're fantastic birds, so I had to include them in a talk. This is the red-breasted Maganza. Um, present um, on the marsh uh, pretty much from October through till sort of April sort of time. Um, we get good numbers, they, they always peak in February normally. Um, the small numbers around at the moment, the numbers tend to build slowly over time. But good tip, if you want to go out and see um, red-breasted mergansas on the marsh, uh, as long as there's a westerly wind, they, they will always uh, be roosting in Oxy Lake. Um, they tend to leave roost quite early, so going in at dawn isn't so reliable. But if you were to head out there at dusk and look at Oxy Lake, either off of the seawall at Normandy Marsh or Oxy Marsh, they'll, they'll gather in there. Um, and that's when we do, we do the, the counts uh, of Magansas. We, we generally do that in Oxy Lake. It's always worth doing because over the years, uh, I've had a few sort of treats crop up in amongst the mergs where all the sea ducks will, will roost out there. So every now and then there might be a, a velvet scoter or flock of scoters or either or whatnot, so it's always worth a look. And golden eye, um, another, uh, another uh, a classic annual bird that we get, never, never in big numbers. Um, generally, yeah, it would be, be less than 10 that we would have. Um, and again, they tend to favour that, that Normandy Limington end of the marsh. Again, just because Normandy Lagoon is deep water, they favour to fish there and roost offshore in Oxy Lake generally. Um, here we've got a classic uh, adult male and a female in the foreground that's um, getting a little bit frisky. This was taken in March. Um, we do generally most years we'd have maybe one or two uh, males such as this one and all the rest would be your classic redheads um, but again another another little tip to distinguish between between your female and the juveniles which in uh, will uh, generally appear similar is looking at the tip of the bill again as you can see here in the adult female that we've got there's a little pale patch to the tip of the bill um, the juveniles won't have that patch. So you can, if you see a flock of them offshore, you can tend to distinguish between the females and the juveniles. Not always easy, uh, especially if they're in choppy water and at distance and it's dusk, but uh, worth a try. And then this is another classic um, of the marsh, which is the, the Slavonian grebe, a small grebe. Um, uh, we, it's not unusual to have all of the grebes at uh, one point or another throughout the winter uh, on the marsh, but the, the constant uh, species that we have are Slavonian and great crested grebe offshore, little grebe on, on the lagoons. Um, from my very biased perspective, Slavonians have got to be the star of the show. Um, they're fantastic birds and they're great, great entertaining birds to watch. Uh, they can be difficult to find during the day because what they'll do, they'll go off and feed 
and they're like fairly sheltered calm waters to go off and feed so you can they, they'll spread out across the western solent uh, but again as with the megansers at dusk they'll gather in oxy lake to roost um, so again that's when we go to try and check how many there are in the area it's going to look at oxy lake at dusk um, it's important that you have a westerly wind when you're doing that uh, because it's the reason they roost there is it's because the most sheltered part of the reserve um, uh, inside the seawall uh, there on Oxy, Oxy Lake. Um, if you have an easterly they'll probably roost up at Keyhaven and they're harder to see there. So if you've got a westerly uh, go and have a look at dusk off of the Oxy Sea Wall and you'll see, see how many slabs we've got. Uh, so divers, again we'll, we'll generally in an average year we'll get get all three divers during the winter months. Uh, the, the regular species is the Great Northern Diver which is which is present, there's some out there at the moment offshore um generally always out in the middle or uh, they like to feed around the Livington river mouth um but this this is a red throated diver um so it's slightly paler and it's got that kind of upturned almost sort of snooty look to it that they have uh they're smaller um and generally they're less frequent although in recent years we've had a pulse of them in late december and through january it's a good time to go out and look for them uh, mid-channel. Um, every now and then you'll get lucky and one will, one will come in close, um, such as this one did, um, but unfortunately with divers they're always, always a bit of a challenge. And then Brent geese. I can't, I can't talk about the marshes without talking about Brent geese. Uh, so they are the sound of, of the winter on the marshes as they, they're bubbling away across the marsh. Um, Brent geese um, are, are present from uh, September through till sort of April sort of time really, uh, where they carry on moving through into May. Um, here we've got uh, a family group, but you can see um, uh, the, the youngsters here, all the ones showing their, their upper wing. Um, you can see the paler markings on them, uh, denoting them as youngsters. Adults would have an all dark upper wing, um, you can see. And they, as I say, they're ever present. Numbers tend to peak uh, with Brent geese in February, early February, as birds start to move back through. Um, so we get a peak earlier on and then a peak later um, as they move up and down the Solent on their way um, northwest, or northeast, sorry. And then um, we occasionally get the scarcer geese, white fronted geese. When I first started birding uh, uh, on the marshes, were pretty much annual. Um, they, they sadly no longer are. Uh, but if you get a cold spell at any time, a little snap of cold weather, in particular, if you keep an eye on the forecast, a snap of cold weather on the continent, um, it's a good time to go out looking for uh, grey geese, and in particular white fronts. This is a flock of, I think it was a flock of 24 that turned up for a few days a few years ago. Um, I think they were the last ones I, I saw on the marsh. Um, but yeah, with, a, with any severe cold weather on the continent, you can get, most likely would be white fronts, uh, but we also have on occasion pink feet and bingies turn up. Um, and again, they can turn up anywhere though. There's no, there's no favored spot. These were on Oxy. I tend to record all of mine on Oxy, but that's probably a result of me spending all my time there rather than um, their distribution. And finally, Marsh Harrier. So, as I said a minute ago, when I was talking about white-fronted geese, they used to be pretty regular and they are no longer. It's kind of the reverse for marsh harrier. Uh, back in the day, it was always a red letter day to have a marsh harrier on the reserve, but uh, rolling forward today, it's almost an expected uh, that you'd see a marsh harrier out there during the winter months. Um, they roost they roost at two sites on the marsh, one, one at the uh, western extremity and one at the eastern extremity. Uh, um, and so it's a good time to find them, uh, to, to watch them is at dawn or soon, maybe about half an hour after dawn when they leave their roost and they roam around a bit. Um, so it's not unusual to maybe see two or three moving around, upsetting up all the other birds. Um, uh, but like I say, it's, it's always, always gives me a bit of a thrill because they still seem rare to me, but um, even though I see them most days, lovely birds to have around. So move on into spring. Um, Probably my favourite season, as with most birders, I guess. Okay, so um, spring is all about migrants, of course. Um, so um, 
I guess generally your, your first your first signs of spring are that singing chiff chaff that you might hear. Uh, but for me, I always love seeing the first proper sort of sub-Saharan migrants. And so little ringed plovers and wheat ears are always always a highlight for me. Uh, little ringed plovers are cracking little birds, and and they'll turn up in early March, often or mid March. Um, little balls of aggression. Um, at that time, we have ringed plovers on the lagoons, but LRPs they'll they'll come in and see them off no trouble uh, they're very domineering aggressive uh, birds um, and you know if, if we have them breeding on site they can spend half their time scrapping with the ringed plovers and, and, and not really focusing too much on their, their breeding season but very entertaining and good quality to watch if you're out and you're not sure if you've got a ringed plover I mean uh, little ringed plovers little ringed plovers are generally around from like I say from March and they leave quite early so it's unusual to see one beyond mid-September but look out for that eye ring. That yellow eye ring is, is the key. Um, and uh, other features to look for are the all dark uh, bill that they have. And also you can kind of see in this picture, the very long tail. Um, so by comparison to a ringed plover, a little ringed plover is almost very sleek and streamlined. Whereas a ringed plover is quite a dumpy, dumpy um, bird uh, by comparison. Um, little ringed plovers will always be on the lagoons. Um, it's, very rare to see them offshore, whereas ringed plovers, you'll get the majority of them offshore coming onto the lagoons to roost, um, except for where they're breeding. Um, and like I say, they're forever scrapping. Um, so it's a good time to get a comparison. Uh, gargany, gargany is another spring highlight. Um, you need to be out early in the morning for gargany. Uh, we get them pretty much every year. I, I can't remember a year I, I haven't recorded Gargany, but um, they're very shy, timid birds. Um, so if you're, if you're out one of the first of the day, uh, it's the time to go and see them. Um, sort of two or three dog walkers in and, and they'll go and skulk back at the uh, back in the reed beds and, and sort of go out of sight. Um, like I say, early morning is a good time to go and see if any uh, Gargany have dropped in. Generally, we have two waves, one come through in March and then another come through in May. Um, tend to be more in May, um, so it's a good time. Good time to go out early in the morning, anyway. And then for me, the bird of the spring has got to be the Mediterranean gull. Um, they're they're again they're another sort of fairly new species. Um, they when I first started birding in the marsh, it was always a nice day to see a, a Mediterranean gull. Then maybe 15 years ago, they started breeding on the reserve and we were sort of jubilant about that. It was absolutely fantastic to have med gulls. I'm a massive fan of med gulls, but we soon learned that they are a bit of a bit of a blighter as well because um, they've, they have quite a taste for little turn chicks in particular. Uh, but chicks of any species, they don't seem to be too fussy. And they're, they're very aggressive uh, predators of young birds. So, Fortunately, we have them breeding, but not in massive numbers uh, on the on the marsh. But in the spring, and again in the autumn, they often gather there, uh, particularly pre-breeding. We can get big numbers, um, three-figure counts of Mediterranean gulls. And to me, uh, if we just roll on to the next slide, uh, this is the sight and sound of not only the marshes but Lymington as well, um, and uh, the, the local area is med gulls going around calling. Uh, giving their, their very distinctive sort of new um, call that they give, um, very sort of almost feline. Um, uh, even out in the forest, you can hear them moving around. Um, it's quite a short-lived thing through sort of April and May, um, and then they'll, they'll move on. But yeah, a, a wonderful bird to have around. And then part of the spring um, is, is passage. Um, the Limington Key Haven marshes are quite well renowned for the for their sea watching, but I won't, I won't touch on that particularly because we're talking Limington Key Haven, the, the sea watching is generally off of, of Hurst, but we do pick up quite a bit of the passage from the marshes itself. And here is a classic example. This is a flock of Wimbrel uh, that would be passing through in May. Um, we can get quite big numbers. Uh, they come through in waves. Um, I think, uh, I'm trying to think now, though I think the biggest day count I've had is, is well over a thousand uh, Wimbrel and um, they can, can seem to be everywhere where they're passing through. And they have a very distinctive call um, that seems to carry an awful long way. Now I would I would mimic that but I as anybody that knows me will know that I am the world's worst bird mimicker so I'll save you from that pain but it's worth looking up the, the call of the Wimbrel, it's a great call. And another bird associated with that that's passing through the Solent at this time of year is the bar-tailed codwet. Uh, so we have bar-tailed codwets year-round. Um, 
We have small numbers in the winter, maybe a, a dozen or so can be found um, over low tides during the winter. During the summer, we might have one or two over summer, uh, but then we can get a massive passage going through the Solent um, again in May. Um, and I think the record day on these was about 2,700. It's get phenomenal numbers. And when that happens, they're just pretty much everywhere. You get a sea of Bartel Godwit. It's not only are they passing through, but they're stopping off to feed. So they'll be on the lagoons and offshore. And it's, it's a wonderful spectacle. It often only lasts for a few days, but it's, it's absolutely heavenly um, to go out there and be surrounded by these, these beautiful migrant birds. About half of them will be in this lovely brick red plumage, the other half yet to molt, and in their gray plumage. Uh, but it's, it's one of those, those special occasions. It happens only maybe once every few years, and then you've got to be lucky to be out on the right day at the right time. But when it happens, it's, it's, uh, it's what it's all about, really. And it'd be, be rude to talk about godwits and not mention black-tailed godwits. So um, we, have, we have good numbers of black-tailed godwits also pass through, but we, equally we have good numbers uh, over winter on the marshes. Uh, occasionally we'll have a few over summer as well. Uh, very erratic in their, in their movements. Uh, it's all, all dependent on feeding conditions. Uh, so at the moment there aren't a huge number around because it's just too wet. Um, so they'll, they'll all they'll be elsewhere. But um, there's, there's a few, there's 40 or 50 around on the marsh at the moment. Um, but they do look splendid. As in, in May you can see them in this, in this lovely brick red plumage and again in August and September when they come back uh, they'll still be in this, this plumage before they molt into their grey plumage. Uh, and then again, talking about breeding birds, Avocet uh, is one of our recent success stories. Uh, they only started breeding recently as, as only about uh, five or six years ago. Uh, and now we have a good, good healthy population of Avocet uh, breeding on the marsh. Um, uh, it, was, it was kept quiet for a while, but it's now it's, they're, they're uh, on every lagoon and being hugely successful. Um, and again, that's a good species I'd recommend to go out and watch in, in maybe June. Uh, mid to late June when they've got young, uh, they're such fantastic parents, uh, ultra aggressive and I've, you know you can sit and watch them, watch a pair with young and they'll, they'll see off great black back gulls and uh, even peregrines, all sorts, they've got no fear, um, very entertaining to watch. Uh, they are present on the marsh all year round um, so it's worth looking now as well. So spotted red shank, one of the questions is what is my favourite patch bird? And that is the spotted red shank. Um, I've got a bit of an affinity for, for spotted red shanks. Um, this, is, this is one that's molting into, into summer plumage. Um, it's not quite all there yet, um, but most years we'll have maybe up to about a dozen spotted red shanks wintering on the marsh. Out of those, maybe two or three will hang on until they're in their full um, summer plumage like this one. Um, and, and then they'll generally be gone by mid-May back again from August. So they are with us really pretty much most of the year. Uh, fantastic bird. If you want to go out and see them, the place to go is, is either Sultan's Lagoon or Oxy, Oxy Marsh. In low tide they'll feed in Oxy Lake. Uh, they feed by sight so they're looking for prey. So they like to go to those sheltered spots where they can see the prey in the water. Um, and they'll, they can, when we've got large numbers, maybe up to a dozen, they'll feed in unison, swimming in a line, trying to, to, to uh, push fish along a lagoon. Every now and then one will catch one, like this one here, it's caught a little tiddler and it will break off and go and sort of almost put its back to the others like it's hiding in a corner and spends an inordinate amount of time trying to swallow the fish. Uh, it almost looks uncomfortable watching it, uh, but it will do it and then it will go back and join its, join its mates. But yeah, that's why I could back to lyrical about spot shanks all day, but we better move on. Um, so yeah. Uh, common red shanks. Uh, so common red shanks are uh, ever present on the marsh. They're probably the most sort of ubiquitous wader on the marsh. Uh, they breed. They have good good breeding success on the marsh, and they're sort of not called the the uh, warden of the marsh for nothing. They're probably the most obvious bird. Uh, always the first to alarm call and and um, get in a flap if if a, a raptor is in the area. Um, but especially uh, in the spring period. So. Uh, March through till June really. It's a good time to count and see spotted red shanks defending their territories. They're very easy to count the breeding spotted red shanks because they give themselves away just like this bird. Uh, just walking along the seawall they'll hop up and try and see you off. Um, so it's yeah they make our lives fairly straightforward fortunately. Uh, lapwings similar. We have good numbers of lapwings all across the marsh and they can be very entertaining. Uh, again if you're if you're one of the first people out on the seawall in the morning at dawn 
uh, and you walk around, you'll get mobbed like this by every single lapwing along the way. They'll come and see you off. After about the third or fourth person that's passed by, they kind of get it and think, okay, I'll, I'll give up. Um, but it's fantastic to be the first person out and to be mobbed by every lapwing as you walk along. Um, then they'll settle down uh, with, with their, um, whatever they're up to, depending on the time of year, uh, inside the seawall. But they have, good, they have good breeding success. We lose a lot of chicks to predators, but most years we have quite a good number uh, make it through, uh, good parents. And this, yeah, they're super cute as well. So this is a young, a young lapwing from a couple of years ago on, on Normandy Lagoon. Uh, amazing, they wander around in the open like that. Uh, it's a surprise they, they more don't get plucked off by the black of the gulls, but the parents do a good job uh, keeping them up. Uh, and barn owl. Um, so barn owl is another regular bird on the marsh. And there was a question about barn owl, uh, so that's why I, I thought I'd, I'd broach that now. So barn owl um, do breed on the marsh. They haven't bred in 2020. Uh, they last bred in 2019. Um, there was a period going back about 10 years where we had two pairs on the marsh, and one of the pairs in particular was quite showy, and they, they bred at Normandy, the Normandy end of the marsh, in, in a, an outbuilding. And they were always out, uh, quite, you know, a couple of hours after dawn and a couple of hours before dusk. And so they were quite obvious and became almost like uh, little celebrities in their own right. But unfortunately, both of those got killed in the same year, uh, road accidents in Lymington, um, which is tragic. Um, so they were lost. But subsequently, we have had them breeding again. Um, so there's one pair. Uh, at the Normandy end, like I say, they, they didn't breed this year, but they did last year. And there's a pair at the Keyhaven end. So they're actually not within the bounds of, of the nature reserve. They're actually just slightly outside on some private land. Um, but they breed there. They're in a nest box that gets monitored by a, by a colleague uh, each year. Um, and they're generally, most years, they're successful and have fledging. But both of these both of these ones, particularly the ones at the Keyhaven end, are quite nocturnal. So it's different, with, it's, it's unusual with barn owls. You get some that seem quite bold and will go out by day, others that are, are slightly more nocturnal. Um, part of that is down to food availability and, and hunting conditions. But this Keyhaven pair are always almost strictly nocturnal. So you've got to be kind of lucky. You've got to be out pretty much in, in the dark to stand a chance of seeing them, unfortunately. Okay, that takes us on into the summer. Um, I'll probably say my favourite season for every season, uh, but that's just kind of the way I am. I like all the seasons. So if we roll on um, and look at uh, summer. So summer can be a bit quieter from a birder's perspective. It can be a bit quieter, but if, if you're um, into your patch birding, it can be a busy time. So your, your warblers uh, on the Limited Keyhaven Marshes, reed warbler, uh, this one, a fairly drab, um, a nondescript warbler, um, but uh, yeah, a fantastic bird. Every little patch of reeds, no matter how, how big or small, will have its uh, resident reed warbler in it, um, chundering away um, through the day. Um, so it's worth keeping an eye out for those. Um, and then we roll on through, the, there's a few of warblers here, I think. Uh, so this is lesser white throat, uh, which, is, which is another classic bird of the marsh. We have varying numbers, I'd say between four and six pairs each year. Uh, again, it's, it's another bird, a bit like the reed warbler, there's more often heard than seen. Um, but we know from ringing that they can be quite successful on the marsh. Um, and yeah, as I say, I think there's about four pairs this year. Uh, and it's this Dartford warbler. Um, so yeah, Dartford warbler uh, has uh, breeds, breeds on the marsh. We had three pairs this year. Um, I think in, in the peak, prior to the, to the big freeze that we had back in 2017-2018, we, we had about five or six pairs, but they all got knocked back in that really cold winter and they're just coming back now. So we've got two pairs at the Keyhaven end, one pair at the, the Normandy end of, of the marsh uh, that I'm aware of. Um, uh, but all, all three of those I know have successfully fledged along young this year, so hopefully there'll be more in future years. Uh, and this is water rail. So water rail breeds all across the reserve. And it's probably one of the hardest birds to survey and to monitor and to get a grip of because you know, you'll hear them calling doing that sort of pig squeal call that they do in, in the reeds. Generally nocturnally, uh, it's a good, good if you're going to survey water rail, it's good to go out at night to do it. Um, but 
uh, it, they're very difficult to get a grip of numbers. But I had to include this because this is the only picture I've got of, of, of chicks. This was taken on Sultan's Marsh in a year that I didn't think there was a pair on Sultan's Marsh. And then I was walking past one morning, having walked past there pretty much every day. And um, this, I saw this adult with two, two very young, very cute chicks. Uh, they went on to do quite well. They survived. I saw them again about two or three weeks later. Um, so as well as the breeding birds on the marsh, when I say on the marsh inside the sea wall, there's also, as, as I'm, I'm sure we're all well aware, a big colony of birds offshore. Uh, so this is an image of, of cockle shell, which is the, the bit of sea wall, uh, salt marsh off of Normandy Marsh, with, as you can see here in the foreground, um, sandwich terns and Mediterranean gulls. The, the colony is largely made up of uh, black-headed gulls. Um, and these, these Mediterranean gulls typically gather early in the spring, uh, and it looks like we, we're going to have hundreds every year, but then ultimately we only end up with, with a few pairs because they, they uh, get territorial, but then move on. So we move on. Uh, so one of my highlights, I, I don't do this every year, uh, but when I can, I'll help Pete, uh, who's the warden, and aid, uh, and maybe Jules, the assistant, to count the gull colony. So every year the colony get, does get counted. Um, and the way we do that is we, sit, we go out in a, in a little boat and uh, uh, we'll have a big, big bag of pasta. Uh, and each bag of pasta will count in maybe 500 um, bits of pasta. So we know exactly how many bits of pasta are in, in your bag. Some 500, some maybe, uh, maybe more. Um, and we'll go around systematically and put a bit of pasta in each nest. And then at the end of it, we'll count how many bits of pasta are left. And then we'll know how many, how many nests are out there. Um, we put the pasta in but just because the colony is so dense. We try to do it systematically, uh, but you know, just, just to be sure we know which ones have been counted. Uh, the pasta is biodegradable um, and the gulls will come in uh, and they'll, they'll, get, they'll pick up a piece of pasta and spit it out to the side of the nest. Uh, but we tend to know, you can see then, even then, uh, so it's, it's, it's a pretty safe way of counting. Um, I figure for this year, I, I can't, I think it's about 7,000 7, pairs on both sides of the river, I, I believe is the total, but I'd have to double check that for this year. But there's around about that number most years. Mainly black-headed gulls, as I say, that we get out there. We get a handful of Mediterranean gulls. Um, some years we get one pair of lesser blackbacks along with a couple of pairs of great blackbacks, some years common gull in there as well, one or two pairs. Uh, and then we'll have uh, uh, sandwich and common tern, um, ringed plover, oyster catcher. So there's a great mix of birds nesting out there. Uh, some ducks, gadwall sometimes, sometimes even ida. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a great place for a mix of, mix of species. Uh, sometimes we're a bit late, and this is this is the result. This, I had to include this because it's about the only time in their whole life cycle that black-headed gulls are actually cute. Um, so just to prove it, <laughs> there you go. But then other other key uh, seabird species that we have breeding on the marsh. This is a little tern. Um, so little terns have, have got a fairly rocky history, um, with the, as they have with most places they breed. Really, uh, this year has been a fantastic year. We've had them, uh, some good breeding success on. Normandy Lagoon. Uh, most years they'll, they'll try nesting in maybe three or four different parts of the marsh. Uh, generally their success rate is fairly poor, um, but as I say this year on Normandy Lagoon they've done well. It's been a good year for little terns, um, so let's hope they return in number again next year. Um, common terns as well. Common terns will breed offshore and also on uh, one or two of the lagoons um, and they, they've again had a successful year this year, I've seen a number of youngsters fledge, um, and some were hanging around until, until very late in the season, actually. Uh, but then this is this is one of the criminals. So of, of all the of all the predators that we have on the marsh, um, this is this is probably one of the worst. Unfortunately, we don't get many of them. This is the lesser blackback gull. Now, most people, when they when they look at the gulls and they think the great blackbacks are going to be the rogues, and and they're certainly not innocent. They cause a lot of trouble as well. Uh, but there's there's one year where we had I think about three pairs of lesser blackbacks offshore, and they caused absolute carnage. They're absolutely voracious predators, um, very intelligent birds. They knew exactly what they're doing and where they're going to get what they wanted. Um, but these these single-handedly did for our little terns one year. Whereas the black uh, the great blackbacks, a little bit more indiscriminate. Um, 
whereas the, the letters are very much more targeted. But a new, a new uh, issue we have, I was talking about marsh harriers uh, before, marsh harriers are quite voracious predators of, of uh, chicks as well, so that's, a, that's, another, that's another challenge that we have. So, autumn. Um, autumn is very much a, a time for waders. Um, it's for me. It's, it's you know. It's a great time to, to get out and get to grips with waders. So for, for us, for us as, as uh, uh, we we think we tend to think of autumn as as the period from sort of September, October, November is the meteorological autumn. Whereas uh, in the head of a wader, they're they're heading back on autumn passage from from mid mid July. Uh, so really, from from late July onwards is a great time to catch up with waders that are moving back through on the marsh. Green shank being a classic, uh, we get green shank overwintering on the marsh in uh, in small numbers um, uh, this weekend. And on the webs camp, I think we had seven or eight on Normandy Lagoon. But you can get big groups gathering in the autumn of maybe twenty or thirty. Uh, places like Normandy Lagoon are great, Fishtail Lagoon, Butts Lagoon, uh, Jetty Lagoon. Places to go and see them. Uh, turnstone. Uh, so turnstones are much ever present um, passing through uh, from northern climes um, some some will over summer um, but they're the, uh, the sort of regular bird that you have picking around on the sea wall uh, all along the length of the sea wall um, over at high tide they'll they'll gather on places like this this is the the piles of the from the old sea wall uh, that are off of jetty lagoon uh, where turnstones all go and um, uh, Reese over high tide. Um, it's good. To, it's good to look amongst the turnstones for purple sandpiper. The past couple of, past couple of years, we've had purple sandpiper uh, on the marsh, which is which is uh, was quite exciting for me. That's the first first I'd had on the marsh about two, two or three years ago. Um, and what it is, we've got a bird uh, that appears to be spent, liking to spend the winter winter around Milford and uh, Hurst Beach. Uh, when you have the high spring tides combined with a strong westerly wind, it will hop over the sea, hop, hop over Hurst Beach and spend uh, the high tide period in with the turnstones. Uh, so it's a good time to go and look for it. Uh, Dunlin is the most, will be the most numerous wader that we have in the area. Uh, so the big groups of Dunlin moving around, uh, particularly at high tide, is a good time to go and see them as they all try to cram onto islands on lagoons. Um, this weekend, as an example, counting the, the Normandy Lagoon for the webs count, uh, I think it was 1,200 Dunlins we counted crammed into a, onto a couple of islands, uh, but the overall count for the marsh will be nearer, nearer 4,000. So there's, there's huge numbers of them. And there's always, will, there will be another talk about wader ID, but Dunlin, Dunlin is one of the birds to get to know really well because uh, they're, they're the most common um, and frequently observed bird, uh, wading bird on the marsh. They get to know those well, and they're often the ones that, that uh, have, have some of their scarcities hiding in amongst their flocks. So it's good to get to know them. Oh, and talking about that. Uh, so um, this, is a, this is a curly sandpiper, uh, a juvenile curly sandpiper. Uh, we get small numbers passed through in the autumn, generally August, September, sometimes into early October. Um, and they'll often, uh, be found in amongst the flock of Dunlin. Um, to, to pick out the differences, they're slightly longer legs, much more finer build, um, a lot sleeker. Um, so here, standing alone, it it looks um, looks rather similar. But in amongst the flock of Dunlin, it, they do tend to stand out. Um, for me, they're almost like the perfect wader. Really, I think if if you were to if somebody was to give you a blank piece of paper and say, look, here you go, design the perfect wader. I think you'd end, you'd end up with something probably like a curly sandpiper, sort of long-legged, long build. All the proportions are just right. Um, but yes, yeah, so they're, they're a great bird to look out for. And if, if you've got a flock of Dunlin flying around you, um, which is often the case on the marshes, keep an eye out for birds with white rumps. So it could be something very rare, but in the autumn, more than more likely than not, if you see a bird with a big white rump, it'll probably be a curly sandpiper in the flock. So keep an eye out for that, and, and then when they land, you can uh, try and try and pick it out. And then this is this is the other, along with uh, curly sandpiper, this is a little stint. Uh, they're sort of found um, in, at a similar time. Uh, and this is a juvenile one. Um, apologies for the poor photo. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but little stints uh, in the autumn is almost always juveniles that are passing through and they have this kind of rufous appearance. 
and you can see just on the on its back a hint of a white stripe they'll have two white stripes going down one either side a bit like braces going down their back tiny tiny little wader and it's almost almost like little clockwork toys like they've been wound up uh in amongst the flock of dunlin because they're constantly beavering and stitching in in the in the ground looking for invertebrate prey um this particular one you'll notice has got a ring on it so this turned up in 2014 uh spent a long time trying to decipher what the ring said uh it looked like sex sex and we thought no nobody would put a ring on like that uh but we couldn't think of anything else so we roll on to the next slide it was uh so it was coloring with uh recoding sex um but what was amazing about this bird is that that um i recorded it at normandy marsh on the 5th of september 2014 it was actually ringed just four days prior to that, on the 1st of September in northern Norway. And it travelled 997 kilometres in those four days, uh, which in fact we think were three days because we think it was there a day prior at Normandy. We think it was probably at Normandy from the 4th of September, uh, but we didn't pick up the colour ring then. Uh, so it's quite remarkable to see. You can see the size of the bird in the ringer's hand there. It's a tiny, tiny bird. Um, sort of smaller than a sparrow really and to think that it's it's flown all that distance in that time and this is just a part way stop and this this shows you how important places like Limington Keyhaven marshes are because it was stopped off for four or five days just to refuel and refeed and and get itself together again before continuing its mammoth journey uh southwards um if we didn't have these little havens uh in places along the south coast of the UK it would it would be a tragedy for species like little stints that need these stop off points it's vitally important uh and then other species that are around in the autumn uh bearded tits bearded tits are, are present year round on on the marsh but a good time to see them is in in august september october uh because they start to move around a bit more you'll have the years young in with them so the numbers will have swelled a bit um and because they're moving around with youngsters they tend to be a bit more vocal so it's good to it's a good time to um Go and see them. I think we might be going the wrong way. <laughs> okay, um, I'll probably need to speed up a bit anyway. So yes, bearded tit. Uh, a good place to go and see them is Bats Lagoon, uh, where they go and feed. You, you, if you really wanted to see one, the place to, the most reliable place to go is the Avon Water reed beds, uh, but they can be difficult to see there. But they will go across to Bats Lagoon uh, in the reed bed there, so it's a good place to go. Although I've had them in most of the reed beds across the marsh a long time or another. This is a cuckoo. Um, this, this image was taken at uh, Sultan's Marsh. It's just a young uh, rufous toned uh, cuckoo uh, that was taken in October. Uh, quite a late one. Um, the cuckoo breed on the marsh um, and it's just one of, those, one of those classic species that always deserves a mention in any talk. So yeah, this is its mention. Uh, another great species is osprey. Uh, so osprey is, is um, we get them regularly on passage uh, in the spring, uh, but uh, traditionally the period September into early October is a great time to, to see osprey on the marsh until recent years. Um, we haven't had so many records this year and I suspect that might be something to do with sea eagles, I'm not entirely sure, it might be a bit controversial, but uh, traditionally our ospreys would winter in Newtown, or not winter, would, would hold up in um, Newtown Harbour. Uh, for a few weeks to refuel in the Solent uh, and we knew that they generally uh, uh, hung around Newtown Harbour and then would come out on feeding uh, forays uh, up in the western Solent and that's when we'd see them uh, generally two or three times a day off of the marshes. Um, past two years we haven't had them, um, we just had the odd one pass through. We know that Newtown Harbour is a popular haunt um, for eagles so I wonder if they've, they've uh, had an impact on, on where our ospreys hang out. I don't suppose it has a detrimental fact, uh, impact on the ospreys at all. Uh, I know there's good numbers in Pool Harbour, there's lots of other places for them to go, so it's just a selfish moan really that it would be nice to see more of them. But uh, I think birds like the black-tailed godwits here are, are happy to not have them around, to be fair. So um, that's a very quick run through of, I guess, some of the, some of the better bits of the marsh during the course of a year. Um, I could probably talk about all night about all the other bits, but what I do want to talk about is a bit about how I bird the marshes. So I, uh, I bird the marshes, uh, well, for the first probably 15 years, I was out there pretty much every day. Uh, um, nowadays, I'm only out there maybe 
four or five times a week, I guess. Uh, and I just get out there as often as I can. As I think Normandy Marsh is my, is my local beat. So I'll go out there, you know, one day, it might just for my lunch break for half an hour. That's all I've got. Um, but then, you know, at the weekend, maybe I've got four or five hours out there or six hours. And it's fantastic having a local patch where you can go out and you don't have to spend a predetermined amount of time out there. You can just go out and, and enjoy it. Uh, I find it vitally important just to have a bit of headspace. If I'm having a stressful day at work, no, or you know, I don't know, whatever. Somebody is on your case. It's nice just to get out there, turn the phone off, get out on, on the marsh, and just just immerse yourself in wildlife. It's, it's the best therapy in the world. But I like I, I like to feel like I'm I'm doing something useful at the same time. I, I always have. So I've I've kind of got myself involved in in a few bits. Um, the monthly webs count is something, and people are always looking for volunteers for webs. You can do webs at any uh, coastal or inland water body and it's basically a monthly count of all the all the wildfowl and all the waders it's, it's quite a straightforward um, survey uh, along the coast we do it at the spring high tide once a month uh, and the marsh is split into three so we've got three of us out there counting I do the Normandy and Salton spit um, but it's, it's, it's a, a good a, a, a good way to keep a record of what's of the, the peaks and flows of the marsh. We do it year round, not all some sites only do it during the winter. Uh, the other thing I do, I'm, I'm a bit geeky about roosts. Um, yeah, I think roosts are a fantastic way of count, getting all the birds in one spot at one time to count them. Is, is It makes life a lot easier all round and you know you're getting a good count. So I count as many roosts as I can. We have an egret roost, um, which is at Pennington Marsh on the old fishing ponds at Pennington Marsh. It used to be at Normandy Marsh, but they moved across. Uh, so I count that once a month. Um, probably the average number through the year is about 60 egrets. Uh, it peaks in the autumn up to about 100 egrets. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, um, I always do it at dawn. At dusk, it's always a bit tricky because birds come and go, but at dawn, they're all there. Uh, the only time you have a bit of an issue is if a buzzard or something flies in and flushes them all out at the same time and you can't count them. But it's been good. I know over the years it's had some good birds in it. Uh, whenever there's cattle egrets on the marsh, they always use the egret roost. Um, so it's a good place to go and see the cattle egrets and if they're still there. Sometimes I've had cattle egrets in the roost there and nowhere else. And we haven't found them anywhere else. So goodness knows where they're going off to feed, but they're coming back to roost every night. There was a famously a, a, a black crowned night heron there a few years ago. Uh, but I also count finch roosts as well. There's um, as well as roosts. I'm also a bit geeky about finches, so the two combined are a bit, <laughs> a bit of a nightmare. Uh, but there's numerous ro finch roosts across the marsh, particularly green finch and linnet roosts. I've been counting past years, and that's fast. It's a fascinating insight into the ebb and flow of those species on the marsh. And then, as I said, grebes. Um, I mean, where I put grebes, I mean the sea duck and grebe, which is in Oxy Lake. You can see at the top end there, in between Oxy and Normandy Marsh. You can view it from the Normandy Sea Wall or the Oxy Sea Wall at dusk. About a half an hour before the advertised dusk time is a good time to go out and they'll gather in there. As long as there's a westerly wind, uh, they'll be there. Um, I counted it the other day and there's maybe, I can't remember now, 20 Great Crested Greaves and uh, it's in a number of organsas. Uh, no Slavonians yet this year. Um, and then monitoring the breeding birds. Um, that's yeah another passion. It's fairly easy on the marsh with the waders. We we have a broad range of waders breeding on the marsh, along with the terns and the gulls, uh, but also the smaller stuff as well, like the linnets and dartfords. Um, depending on how much time I have in any given year, depends how much effort I put into that. But I always try and focus on the key species, which are those where the data is important. So birds that are monitored by the Rare Breeding Birds Panel, for example, species like Chetty's warbler or water rail, where we have a lack of data. Or important birds like ringed plover, red shank, ones that we know are, are declining. So I, I focus on those as a priority and it's, it's great to get a, get, get a good data set. VisMig uh, is another thing you can do uh, and that's visual migration watching. Um, in, that peaks in the autumn but it goes throughout the year you'll get birds moving. Um, as I said before I like, I like finches so I tend to focus on finches. Um, this year has been a fantastic year for red poles for example and crossbills. Um, there was a period in October where I went out almost every day and I had a crossbill on the marsh almost every day, which was, which was a record for me. 
Um, um, but yeah, you pick up Bramblings, the odd Hawfinch, uh, and various bits and pieces uh, for audience. It's great. It's a good way to learn bird songs and calls as well, because you know, there's always going to be those ones you don't know, and you can just let them go. It doesn't matter. But it's good to it's good to try and get hone your skills on on hearing hearing the birds and trying to identify them. It's really good good practice. Sea watching <coughs> is another specialist thing. Uh, tends to happen more at the Hearst Beach end. I've done a bit over the years from, from Normandy and Oxy. Oxy is a good place to see what's from. Uh, but I'll be honest, I'm not very good at sitting still for very long. Uh, so that doesn't, that doesn't tend to work that well for sea watching. I like to be on the move. Um, so, uh, yeah, sitting still in, in horrible weather. So uh, if, if that floats your boat, then sea watching is a good thing to do. Um, invertebrate surveys is, um, is another great uh, thing. So we've done, we do butterfly transects and various things um, and bird ringing. So I guess bird ringing is a little bit specialist, but we do bird ringing uh, at two sites at the marsh. One at, uh, one at uh, we have one site at Normandy Marsh and one site at Keyhaven Marsh where we bird ring throughout the year, uh, but focus on that key autumn period. So that's a lot on one slide. Okay, so this is a bit of a rubbish photo, but this is the egret roost uh, um, on the fishing ponds. Uh, there's not so many birds here because I had to wait till it got a bit lighter. So that's probably about a quarter of the birds that would normally be present. But that is what the egret roost looks like. Uh, and they're almost a little bit prehistoric when they wake up. They walk around on the branches croaking at one another. Um, generally have a little preen and then fly off in groups of two and three. But it makes it easy to count. Uh, You'd be surprised, you, you look at it at the front there and see all the white dots and think, oh, that's quite easy. But you'd be surprised how many are out of sight actually in the tree itself. And they sort of croak and work their way to the front and have little scraps of one another. Very entertaining. Uh, so then ringing, I'll just talk a very little bit about ringing. So um, as I said before, the ringing we do is at Normandy Marsh and Keyhaven Marsh. Normandy is, is fairly limited. Uh, we do a bit around Normandy Farm, uh, basically. The main focus is at Keyhaven at Eiley Point. So this is an image of the, of the habitat in there. Um, it's sort of dense blackthorn scrub, a uh, bit of gorse scrub as well. Um, so we're targeting passage migrants and um, you know, I'm, I'm not really all that interested in, in, in rarities. What, what we really want to focus on is, is a, to get a good year on year track record of what's passing through. And the only really easy way you can do that is by ringing. Um, uh, to get a record of what's moving through and also what's breeding on site as well. Um, and so we try to have a, a fair amount of consistency in, in effort year on year. And, and these, these uh, ringing sites um, are, are run in a similar way to how we run Keyhaven up and down the country. So by comparing different sites, particularly along the south coast, it's good to have the comparisons year on year and you can get a feel of how good the year has been for, for a range of species. So on, on the next, I think it's on the next slide, I've, I've given a bit of an overview for this year. So this year has been a funny year because we weren't allowed to ring in the spring um, because of COVID-19. So we tend to focus on linnet and, and other breeding birds in the spring. And then as soon as we were allowed to start ringing in May, and my focus was on the new forest and hawfinches. So we didn't really properly start ringing until probably July at Keyhaven. So this is kind of a half year's worth of data. But so 2020 to date, we've ringed 1,700 birds of around 50 species. And so the, the, the highlights are their black cap. We've, we've ringed 360 black caps so far at Keyhaven. Um, uh, that's a fairly average year for black cap, I would say. Uh, we know there's only maybe a dozen or so breeding in the Keyhaven area. So the majority of these are migrants passing through. And that, that we've had records of, of black caps that we've ringed coming from, from the Midlands, uh, from North Wales, uh, and also further south in Spain and France, where they've been moving through. But what is fascinating, some years we get the same birds that we know are migrants, but they're passing through the same site. One, one particular bat cat we caught three years running, um, which is fascinating. And then Chiff Chaff, 280, which is quite a good year for Chiff Chaff. Uh, normally we'd do about 200. Uh, Willow Warbler, again, 65. So there's only one pair of willow warbler breed at Keyhaven. So uh, all of these are migrants that are passing through. There was a time when you would catch as many willow warblers as you would chiff chaffs, uh, but not, um, no, not anymore. Chiff, uh, willow warbler numbers are way down. 
Uh, robins is also another interesting one. We have a number of, of breeding pairs of robin at Keyhaven, maybe about a, a dozen or so pairs, but to catch 50 in a year goes to show. We always get a peak about this time, or sort of October, as we get migrant robins coming in. Uh, you can sometimes tell the migrant robins because they have slightly longer wing lengths. Um, it's quite interesting. Tree pipits is another, is another classic migrant that you get through. It's interesting, you know, you can go out on the marsh on a day and maybe hear two or three tree pipits um, flying around and you think that's quite good. I think the best day when I've been out birding is maybe about a dozen, but we've caught 40 in a day at, in the nets at Keyhaven. So it goes to show how many are passing through and how many get detected. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, lesser red pole, um, as I said, um, Lesser red pole has been fantastic. We, we rarely catch lesser red pole at Keyhaven. This year we've caught 120. Of those 120, there's three, oh, sorry, two. We've had two controls at Keyhaven and one from, from elsewhere. So uh, the two controls at Keyhaven, so a control, by the way, sorry, is a bird that's been ringed before. Uh, one of the lesser red poles was ringed about 10 days previously in North Northumberland. Uh, and the other one was ringed about 15 days previously. In Nottinghamshire. So it goes to show that their lesser red poles are moving south. And then the other one ringed at the other site was from Derbyshire. Uh, it makes sense that we'd have the lesser red poles. It's been a fantastic breeding year for lesser red poles this year. It was a good year for them in the forest and it's been a good year for them across the country, uh, getting three broods off. So it adds up that we'd get 120 or a good number uh, moving down. Linnet is another one we target, 230. Actually, that's not this year's number, that's last year's number. But last year we were in 230, uh, I believe that's all youngsters. Um, and that just goes to show how many linnets we've got breeding in the area. And I'll talk a bit more about linnets in a bit. Uh, night jar is another one. So we've got night jar breeding at, at um, Eiley Point. Uh, there's certainly two, possibly three pairs. Uh, but what is interesting, the adult male um, that we first ringed uh, in 2018, uh, to put it in context, I've only been breeding there since 2017, uh, was the first time they started breeding. Um, but we ringed an adult male in 2018 and we have recaught him each year. It's the same bird returning to breed there in one of the pairs. Um, and they're both, both pairs have been successful this year, so we caught some youngsters. And then this is another one of the classic birds that you pick up when you're ringing that you may not when you're out birding is, is grasshopper warbler. This year has been our worst year for grasshopper warbler. Actually, we've only had two. Uh, in an average year, we'd have maybe 15 or 20 grasshopper warblers. Uh, but this year has been a poor year, uh, which is, you know, it's contrary to most other warbler species. I wonder if maybe we've just been unlucky. I haven't compared data with elsewhere, but the other, the other theory is that maybe uh, in the dry, the dry spring and summer, uh, maybe didn't work well for, for grasshopper warblers. Uh, and next. And then this is the yellow brow warbler. Uh, so this is, uh, I think it's four years running. Uh, yellow brad warbler has been caught at Keyhaven, or maybe three years running. Um, uh, it's always always only one each year, and I, I spend an awful lot of time out there at Keyhaven. Uh, um, I don't think they hang on for the winter. I think they're just moving through, um, so we just just get lucky each year. And then finally, I'll talk about linnets. So uh, you ran, when you're around the marsh, keeping out for colouring linnets uh, with a colouring combination on their legs. So we've been colouring in them for the past couple of years, uh, uh, just to try and understand them a bit more. Linnets are uh, 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 red-listed species. They're in heavy decline. Um, and not, they're not all that well understood. Um, we know a lot about their breeding biology, but not about where they're going or what they're doing. What we have learned at Keyhaven is that we've got two populations of linnet. There's the summer, the breeding population that's present from May through to October. Uh, they're the ones we colour ring. They will disappear in October. Um, and we have an, a, another population kind of moving in their stead. They use the same roosts, interestingly, uh, but they're different birds um, with different habits. Um, and uh, in amongst those, we have had one or two of our colour ring birds, but the majority of our colour ring birds move off elsewhere. Where they go, we don't know. Uh, and where these ones come from, we similarly don't know. There's still a lot to learn about linnets, but hopefully colour ringing will help unravel some of that. But if you do see a colour ringed linnet out and about, do please uh, drop me a note. And then I'll just, we'll whiz through this quite quickly, just be conscious of the time, um, but this will just talk about some of the rare breeding birds. This is a red back shrike. Uh, this is the first rare bird I ever found at, at Normandy. Uh, some years ago, so that deserves inclusion. Um, 
the next. Uh, this is a short-toed lark. Uh, this is probably the rarest bird I found on the marsh. This was at Normandy just for one day. In fact, I can remember the date, 10th of May 2012, I think it was. Or was it the 12th of May 2010? Anyway, um, it was in May, that's for sure. Uh, that was unfortunately just the one, one day wonder. And then I'll just run through very quickly some of the others that have turned up over the years. This is a citrine wagtail. This is at Butts Lagoon. Again, that was a one day wonder. I've not, not seen one again. Uh, on the marsh. Uh, Rhinek. Rhinek is an annual bird, pretty much. Uh, there's a lot of places for them to get hidden in, unfortunately, so they're, they're, they're difficult to pick up. Uh, but Key Haven is a good spot uh, around there. If you're walking around where the gorse bushes are around Eiley Point, have a good scan in there. That's, that's where they like to tuck themselves into quite often. Great Bristy Goose. Uh, this was uh, I think 2008. Uh, this is a bird we had. It spent the winter at Normandy one year. It did. It did go off to the dark side at Key Haven for for a month or so in that time. But uh, it spent most of its time in Normandy. The following year, it moved back through. It came back through uh, Normandy in in the autumn. Went off and spent its winter in Dorset, and it came back through in February on its way back through. So it was nice to to track that back and forth. A uh, great white egret. Uh, there was a time when that was like a mega rare bird on the marsh. I remember seeing my first one. I was very excited. Uh, but now they're, they're relatively common. Um, I think I've seen six or seven on the marsh this year. Um, this often, though, they're flying over. This is one that actually hung around feeding for a few days. This was an oxy, oxy lagoon. Uh, it's not often you see them that well on the marsh. Uh, cattle egret, uh, it's another uh, another fairly irregular uh, bird that will turn up. I think they turn up most years, but often they don't get seen or picked up very readily. Blackwing stilts, we had a pair. This was a pair that, that actually settled to breed maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, um, and we were all very excited about that. Uh, Organised a watch to keep an eye on the nest. Uh, but then we had a thunderstorm overnight that saw them off, sadly. Um, so, so they didn't. They didn't settle in the end. Uh, lesser sand plover or Mongolian plover, 2003, I remember that one. Uh, that's probably one of the rarest birds we've had in recent years. Lesser yellow legs, uh, Normandy marsh. Uh, yeah, I suppose we're going to get more of those. This is a Kentish plover, uh, a bird that you, was more common at one point, uh, but is very much a rarity nowadays. Uh, Baird sandpiper, um, an American vagrant that's turned up a couple of times in recent years. And the next slide is a semi palmated sandpiper, again another one that's turned up maybe two or three times in recent years, uh, straight across to Normandy a few times. Um, uh, snow buntings. Uh, snow buntings at one point were pretty much annual. Uh, these two are on her spit. Um, I remember my first one, I was very annoyed. I had a phone call from Pete Donnell, it was probably 20 years ago now, said there's a, there's a snow bunting on the seawall at Normandy. So I, I was at home, I raced down, it took me two minutes uh, and I got there, saw a peregrine flying away and he said, sorry, peregrines just nabbed it. And so that was it. I had to wait another year before I saw my first one. But uh, yeah, it, you get a cold spell, uh, it's a good time to go out looking for, for snow buntings. Uh, Shore Lark, uh, this was one in 2003 that was on her, her spit. There has been one subsequently four or five years ago. I saw it at Oxy, Oxy Marsh. Uh, again, they're quite rare nowadays, sadly. Waxwing, this is a desperation one, just to show that how desperate patch people can get. Uh, this is in Lymington. Uh, Showing very well. This is a photograph I took in Limington, but I went and stood right on the very edge of the of the reserve and got my scope up, looking at the tree they're in. Little dot. That was enough to tick it off for the patch list. Uh, it's about as desperate as you get. Uh, and of course, recent celebrity Wilson's phalarope that was here with our grey phalaropes uh, a few weeks ago. And another wildlife, we can probably whiz through this quite quickly just because of the, the time. Uh, it says slow worms, quite regular along the seawall and along the back of the marsh. Um, 
Adder, again, ancient highway is a good place to go and see Adders. Uh, again, quite quite regular. Uh, you've got to be sort of lucky, right place, right time. Hare, this picture was taken at Normandy Marsh a few years ago. Well, probably quite a few years ago now. They used to be quite regular around Normandy area, but they're sadly no longer. There's a bit of a story to this one. This, this I took this picture along Normandy Lane. Uh, went off birding, two hours later I came back and it was, it was fantastic originally watching the, the, the adult and the leveret, I had two leverets, um, I spent half an hour watching them and then I came back unfortunately uh, there's two magpies eating them, it's absolutely gutted, uh, that's probably the most gutted I've been on the marsh, devastating. This just cute wood mouse, I can probably skip past that one. Um, Weasel. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few mustelids on the marsh. There's of course uh, weasel. Uh, there's there's badger. Recent um, trail camera images have picked up polecat recently, um, and there's otter. We know is coming semi regular again. So it's good to keep an eye out for mustelids uh, when you're out and about. Uh, this is a sad one. Uh, I, I love my cetaceans. Um, and this, I've, in, in all my time birding on the marshes, there's only been two occasions I know of bottlenose dolphins have been in the Solent. I missed both. Um, and I was gutted to come out and find this common dolphin off of Oxy Sea Wall a few years ago that had died. This was collected by the Natural History Museum in London and they later found out that it had actually died of starvation. Um, so I, I mean, it's no surprise. It shouldn't, a, a common dolphin is a deep water species. It shouldn't be in the Solent. So, yeah, very sad. That's my only, only cetacean record. Uh, and a few of butterflies. This is wool brown, which was once the, the Lymington Key of Marshes was once the, the strong hotspot for wool browns in Hampshire. Sadly, no longer. Um, they seem to be very much on their way out. Uh, green hair streak. That's a bit interesting because this is a favourite of mine. But if you walk around in June, May, June, uh, brushing along the gorse along the seawall, you're bound to flash the odd green hair streak here and there. Uh, Essex skipper, uh, I put this in just because it shows uh, the difference because we get small skipper and Essex skipper and this shows nicely the, the dipped um, antennae like it's been dipped in dipped in ink, a pot of ink or something. Um, it's a good ID feature. Marbled white uh, just because they're gorgeous and um, we don't don't get them so much anymore. We, they, they used to be a very common species on the marsh. They're still present, you can still find them, but numbers are way lower. Uh, I think it's to do with uh, the, the mowing regime, sadly. And then some rarities that have turned up over this. This is Glanville's fritillary uh, that I found. Uh, this is actually on Hearst Beach. Uh, but we've had a few over the years. So it's always worth looking out. I've had a large tortoise shell, various fritillaries, um, Cool blue and stuff. There's, keep an eye out on your butterflies, it's good. And then we'll just run through the moths very quickly. This is a G moth, but this is it's not the most exciting of, of species, but this uh, is on Hearst Beach as well. Uh, as I understand it, the only mainland UK location for G moth. Do you get them on the other way? Uh, garden tiger, relatively common but splendid species of moth that you get quite frequently on the marsh. And lappet. So they, in a typical year, if you go out moth trapping on the marsh, you can maybe catch 500 species of moth. So this is very much tip of the iceberg, uh, but just to give an idea of some of the fantastic species that are out there. Um, I think there's one more, which is the burnet moth. It's a day flying, day flying moth that you can see uh, along the seawall. And wasp spider, fantastic beast of a spider that you can often see in the gorse on the lower path of the seawall. Uh, getting more and more common. Um, so yes, if you want to scare the kids, that's the way to do it. And then just some some flora. Uh, I just wanted to see Campion, Common Century, Sea Aster in the bottom left, and then uh, Biting Stone Crop bottom right. So it's just a taste of the flora that you get. For me, Sea Aster is the, is the is the plant of the the. Uh, of the marsh, the Michaelmas daisy, sign of autumn. But anyway, there's a talk all day about flowers. And then if there's time, I'll just run through a couple of highlights um, for me, highlights of the marsh. So this long-eared owl, uh, this is on my birthday. I think in 2014, I had, it was my birthday. I was at home, uh, it was a weekday. Uh, the kids went off to school, wife went off to work. It was raining, it was grim. And I thought, oh, I'll just go to the marsh for an hour or two. First bird I saw was this long-eared owl sat out in the open in the rain and so yeah my best ever birthday present I have to say it's still the only long-eared owl I've seen there. Uh, this 
it was on a, on a very snowy wintry day uh, and that's what I have to say, if you're birding a patch, if the weather changes, just drop everything if you can and get out. I was at home this day, I had a few field fair red wing, I think over the house, uh, so I thought oh, I'll go to the marsh and this is what I was greeted with. Doesn't look like much, uh, but these are field fairs. Uh, a, a mate of mine, Mark Moody, was also out at the same time. Uh, we spoke to each other on the phone and said, oh my God, loads of birds. So we set about counting them and we got a combined total of 5,000 field fairs in that, on that day, along with uh, I think two or 3,000 red wing, uh, dozens of woodlark and various other, various other unusual birds for the marsh. But field fairs were the thing They're everywhere. It's incredible. And he lasted two or three days and then it's back to normal. So there's field fair, that is one of the field fairs close up just to prove that they are field fairs. Uh, little Orc, I've probably told this story to everybody I see, so you've probably heard it before, but this is a Little Orc on a day of passage one day, there's a pa Little Orcs moving. I sat on the seawall at Normandy, this Little Orc was flying mid Solent, probably a mile and a half away, and it landed in the middle of the Solent, and I was just really pleased with myself for seeing a Little Orc, and then it just swam towards me. And it swam and swam and swam straight to me, uh, literally to my feet, and got out at my feet. And so I had a little dust down and a little preen, plopped in the water, and then swam off again. It was just the most remarkable, bizarre thing that's, that's happened to me. Uh, unfortunately, I was so transfixed by it. This is pretty much the only picture I got as it was actually swimming away, because uh, I was just staring at it, thinking it's not, surely not going to come any closer. Uh, yeah, remarkable. Um, Still don't see many little orcs on the marsh these days. This is a sad one, uh, another really, really stormy day. There's leeches, petrols everywhere. Uh, I went out to Oxy to have a look at the leeches, petrols, and I was very pleased with myself to see three or four of them uh, flying in the Solent. Uh, but I was gutted, I spent a couple of hours there in really rough sea, strong winds, heavy rain. And I just watched them all get taken one by one. First one by a great skewer came and ate it in front of me. And the black back gull got another one. The same bonksy went off and got another one. And in the end, they all got killed. Um, so what turned from jubilation to, to a bit of upset, sadly. And I think there's one last one, which is a bit of a moral in the story in this one. So this is a laughing gull um, that was at eight acre pond in 2005. Uh, and I'd been doing the webs count that day. Uh, and I'd done the whole of, the, whole of my area. I got back to eight acre pond and I counted the little grebes and the mallards and the Canada geese and there's a group of gulls at the end and I thought oh well, we don't count, we only count presence or absence. So I looked at the gulls, saw some black-headed gulls, thought ah, black-headed gulls. That was it, home for a cup of tea, dying for a cup of tea. Literally walked in the front door and had a phone call, there's a laughing gull on eight acre pond, in with the black-headed gulls. So that was it, I was straight back and yeah, I could have, I could have found it myself, uh, but because of my own um, lack of commitment, I just pretty much walked past it. So I was absolutely gutted. So ever since that day, I've not forgotten to check every single bird. And every time I walk past AK to Ace Pond and there's gulls on there, I get a little bit of a shiver down my spine. Um, but that's it. I think that's, that. I believe that's the last slide. Yes, so thank you. Sorry for overrunning a fair bit. Uh, happy to take any questions. If anybody Marcus, has. thanks. Thanks so much for that um, uh, enthralling and you've managed to keep everyone. Well, we've just lost a few, but we pretty much kept everyone. So that's, uh, I think, indicative of how interesting everyone found it. So uh, uh, thanks for a really, really interesting uh, uh, talk tonight, Marcus. Uh, I can only see one question. Um, I'm cognizant we've 15 minutes over. There is only one question that's come in. Um, I normally bird in the morning, would you recommend the afternoon instead? You, you talked about roosting on uh, Oxley. Uh, um, Oxley, um, do you have a personal, um, I mean, I think you mentioned earlier preference for, for morning, Marcus, but, but uh, point, point of view on that, if it, if it was kind of either or, what would you go for? I'd, go for, I'd always go for morning just because you get more of a variety in birds. There there's, tends to be more around. Uh, in the afternoon, things are a little bit more subdued, but it, the afternoons are good to go looking at roosts. It's a good time to go look at roosting birds. So it depends what you want. You get more of a mix and more excitement, I think, in the morning. Earlier the better. Marcus, I think I've got various uh, applaudits coming in thanking you for a very interesting talk. So well done. Thank you uh, so much for that, Marcus. Um, yeah, thumbs up all around. Uh, brilliant. As I said earlier, I'll, um, I'll record it. It will get posted. Hopefully it'll be on the... Uh, uh, via a link via our host website as of tomorrow. Just quick tee up um, talks coming up over the next two weeks. Next week, there's one on red kite. 
and the one after is on goal identification. Marcus obviously has touched on goals tonight, but uh, there'll be a specific talk on goal identification in a couple of weeks' time. So please reach out to uh, Nicola Whitmarsh if you're interested in signing up for either of those. Uh, there's, uh, there's a good, strong um, response already. But uh, we have run last week, some of you might be aware, we ran last week's talk twice because of the uh, level of interest. So we're uh, certainly open to uh, looking at running uh, talks more than one if there's a sufficient interest. But, uh, and we're certainly looking to keep running these talks. They seem to be popular, so we'll keep, uh, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep running as long as there's continued interest. So if there are other, um, Marcus mentioned a waiter ID, um, if there are other um, uh, topics then uh, that you might be interested in please please do post them in and uh, if we get enough interest in them then we'll look to uh, link the topic up with uh, with a with a speaker so um, oh there's one in um, Rufus I remember you asked a question before so uh, I'll get you in again Rufus Rufus age seven as I remember um, would like to know where to spot the lesser red pole Marcus can you uh, give a give a steer on the lesser Ooh. red pole um... Uh, the forest is a good place. So somewhere like uh, maybe Blackwater Arboretum or Boulderwood is good at the moment. Um, maybe later in the year, uh, you tend to get them at the feeders at Blashford Lakes as well. Uh, I think that's later in the winter though. But uh, yeah, the, the forest is probably your best bet. It's good to learn the calls for they've got quite a distinctive call. So uh, yeah, read up on the call and um, okay. it helps you often hear them first. Marcus, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to call it a night. Uh, thank you all for, for staying on tonight. Um, it's great to see so many members joining up and, and staying with us. Uh, wish you all a great evening and uh, hopefully look forward to seeing thank most you. of you or all of you um, at a subsequent talk. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.